Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Jack Reedy, aka Sec IT Guy across all social platforms. And this is INE Live Bits and Bytes Edition, where we bring you the latest news and the tools to address the ever changing cyber landscape. Today, we're going to be talking about the LogForge vulnerability and covering what it is how ubiquitous it is in the world, and what we can do about it. We'll be bringing in one of our offensive operations instructors, uh, Alexia Med, and Jason Alvarado, our defensive operations instructor, uh, to talk about the vulnerability in an enterprise environment with a live demo as well. Now, before we do that, uh, keep up to date on all the relevant technology, news, education, or the goings-on with the company as well. Please hit the like, follow, or subscribe buttons across whatever streaming platform that you are finding us on. As always, we want to be con uh, continued value add and continue that trend with an ongoing AMA live during this stream. If you're unfamiliar with the AMAs, they're very easy. Please throw a cue in front of your question, comment, or concern, or just, you know, even a hype up for us and put it in the chat. Uh, our producers will grab it, throw it our way, and we will bring them up live on the screen with us so we can address them and talk to you directly. Uh, wonderful, wonderful way. Having said that, um, as part of our commitment to you, the students, individuals watching right now, our continued engagement and our continued awesomeness, we want to take this the live demo today, as well as a walkthrough video, and we're going to put it up live on the platform for you within the next couple hours, right after a little bit of tweaking after this live show. Um, but you will today be able to go into the platform and engage with this lab hands on and follow along with Alexi as what he is doing in the demo. Now, I'm going to pivot real quick into a brief log forge summary and let's talk real fast from a high level, what is going on? What is this? Now, the LogForge vulnerability, also known as CVE 2021-4428. Now, it was publicly released last Thursday. In a sense, basically become the main show, if you will. It has definitely sent the world into a tizzy. Um, now, it has been renamed since its release as Log4Shell, um, due to its you know ease of use, if you will. Um, definitely is being targeted by major groups and associations. Um, but what is LogForge itself? Well, LogForge is part of a code library that is controlled by the Apache Foundation. Um, definitely strong, definitely useful, and pretty ubiquitous in many, many applications. Uh, primarily, it is useful for automated logging instances that require vulnerability, or I apologize, uh, variables say vulnerability so much during the day and all of a sudden you can't remember what v starts where but variables um and in that with those variables and the ejection method that are possible and the way that this engages it does so in a um, unusual way having said that it's extremely common in a lot of different types of applications it follows a template and as i stated with the variables it identifies these particular strings and then writes them to a record and engages certain pieces of code in the back end. However, because this, these variables are not specifically checked or inspected for legitimacy prior to the usage, it can execute, execute malicious code that leads to the compromise of the underlying system. Now, it's through a, what's called a JNDI injection attack, but for more on this and the technical issues, I want to pivot over and introduce Alexi Ahmed. Uh, bring him in and let's have a conversation real quick on the details of this and go into the live demo. Alexi, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you, Jack. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, really excited to, to actually showcase this vulnerability and um, showcase how, how it can be exploited. So. Um, I, if I can just take you through a couple of slides uh, and sort of give you an introduction to the vulnerability, um, as well as uh, go over, you know, 
some of the key aspects uh, of uh, you know the underlying technology as well as uh, JNDI injection uh, then you know we can get started so uh, you should be able to see my uh, slides come up um, shortly and uh, we can then get started with that yeah absolutely and appreciate having you here today and uh, I'll bring us into the conversation it's um, yeah, putting the, putting all this together very quickly it's been excellent yep there we go all right all right excellent um so uh before we can actually take a look at a proof of concept and how this uh, can be exploited uh, we need to get an understanding of uh, log4j or logforge uh, depending on your pronunciation and uh, so let's start off by getting an understanding of what it is right so uh, the apache log4j package or uh, system is one of the most widely utilized open source java based logging utilities right so uh, it's used by various Apache solutions like Apache Tomcat, Apache Solar, and Apache Druid, to name a few. So, uh, you know, whenever you have a Java-based application, regardless of whether it's a web application or a standalone application, uh, if you want to implement logging, uh, the pretty much the de facto standard would be Log4j. And uh, as we've already seen over the last one week, uh, many third-party applications and vendors like Twitter, Apple, Steam, and Minecraft have all been utilizing log4j for logging uh, you know to various extents and uh, you know they've actually been uh, confirmed as vulnerable uh, if you want to learn more about the actual attack surface and the totality of the companies uh, and uh, you know pieces of software that have been affected you can check out the github repository linked within the slides and you'll be able to get a better understanding of how uh, you know, uh, or really how big this uh, vulnerability is and how many companies uh, it's actually affecting it's also important to note that uh, log4j version 2.16.0 has been released and actually patches this vulnerability by disabling the GNDI plugin. All right, so now that we have an understanding of what log4j is, let's talk about the actual vulnerability and how it came to be. All right, so on November the 30th, 2021, the Apache log4j development team was made aware of the offer vulnerability in log4j that uh, could allow injection of malicious input that could consequently facilitate remote code execution, right? So they sort of got uh, you know, an early notice of this. And then of course, uh, on December the 9th, uh, 2021, the InfoSec community was made aware of this finding and of course the far reaching impacts of the vulnerability. And the crux of the vulnerability uh, really uh, you know, lies in the fact that this vulnerability could potentially allow attackers to take control of any system that's running log4j uh, by logging a specific uh, a specific string or a specific payload, if you want to call it that. And as we know, as Jack already mentioned, the vulnerability has now been assigned the CVE code uh, 2021-44228 and has a severity score of 10, which is critical. And of course, that tells you exactly what you need to know in regards to how, uh, how dangerous this is. And of course, the vulnerability has now been dubbed Log4Shell, primarily because uh, you know attackers have been using it to gain remote access to uh, to, to remote systems, uh, you know, via a remote uh, or a reverse shell. All right. So now that we have an understanding of that, if we take a look at the severity details, you can see the common vulnerability scoring system 2.0 scores this at 9.3, and version 3 scores it at 10. And you can learn more about the vulnerability if you're interested in that uh, by taking a look at the various um, vulnerability uh, databases out there. So you can take a look at CVE details or NIST, uh, you know, whatever uh, you use to, you know, to actually find uh, and catalog uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so that's, uh, you know, just really more about the vulnerability. And uh, in regards to how it works, uh, in order to understand how this works, we need to get an understanding of how log4j works. All right, now um, log4j uh, will append additional logic to logs by parsing entries, right? And in some cases, the entries could be evaluated or executed just as they are entered into the log files. Now, log4j utilizes the following syntax, uh, again, that allows, uh, you know, that allows it to perform various lookups. And we'll get to this in a second, but the, the syntax is fairly simple to understand. Uh, you have the prefix and the name whereby the name will require evaluation and log messages and parameters do not pro, uh, do not protect against attacker control LDAP or uh, other JNDI related endpoints. And we'll get into this in a second. So 
Uh, what this means is that an attacker could uh, inject a malicious, uh, uh, you know, uh, JNDI LDAP payload into any input, um, uh, into any application input. And if that input is being logged, uh, then, you know, the, the attacker could essentially get, uh, you know, a specific Java class, uh, malicious Java class uh, executed. All right, so we've uh, spoken briefly about JNDI. Uh, so what is JNDI? Uh, well, JNDI uh, stands for the Java Naming and Directory Interface. And the key that you need to take a look at there is the directory interface. So JNDI essentially provides Java-based applications with an API endpoint that can be used to interact with services like LDAP, uh, which stands for the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, uh, in order to access external resources. Now, where does JNDI come into play here? Well, uh, in Apache Log4j versions 2.0 beta 9, all the way to 2.15.0, uh, all of these versions of Apache Log4j come uh, pre-packaged with the, a JNDI lookup plugin. And uh, again, the JNDI lookup plugin, as I said, uh, is used to, uh, you know, it can be used to interact with, uh, you know, directory services and other remote services in order to access external resources. So an attacker could potentially use the JNDI plugin in conjunction with a malicious LDAP, uh, you know, LDAP referral server that's being controlled by the attacker to instantiate a malicious Java class. All right, now the LDAP referral server will then provide a reference to an alternate location with an L where the LDAP request may be processed. And in this case, what we can do as an attacker is set up a, a web server that actually hosts the malicious uh, Java class uh, that will then be executed once the, uh, the, the actual LDAP referral server uh, you know, makes reference to that particular uh, to that particular location or to that particular web server. All right, so let's take a look at the payload that's being used. And if you have been keeping up with uh, the uh, with the log four shell vulnerability, you should be familiar of the following syntax, whereby uh, you can see that the parameter the parameters being passed or that can be injected essentially. Uh, you know, it invokes the JNDI plugin to interact with an attacker controlled uh, LDAP referral server. All right. So as I said previously, all an attacker has to do is identify an application input that is being logged by Log4j and then inject the, this particular payload. Now, the LDAP referral server will then provide a reference to an attacker controlled web server that will be hosting the malicious Java class. And in terms of the uh, the various areas where the, the payload can be injected, uh, with uh, at least in my experience, I've seen it being injected uh, primarily in API endpoints, uh, login forms, and uh, to a certain degree, in HTTP headers. All right. So uh, essentially, what we'll be doing is we'll be utilizing the following payload or the following syntax in order to uh, to, to essentially uh, you know exploit uh, the target system. Uh, and uh, we'll take a look at that in a few seconds. All right, so the exploitation procedures are fairly simple. Uh, we need to set up and configure an LDAP referral server to forward our requests to a malicious HTTP web server that will be hosting the malicious Java class. Uh, we'll then need to set up and compile the malicious uh, Java payload or class, and uh, that's fairly simple. We can set up a uh, you know, very simple uh, Java class that will provide us with a reverse shell when executed. Uh, we'll then need to set up an HTTP web server to host the malicious Java class, after which we can set up a reverse shell listener with Netcat to receive the connection from the Java class once it's exploited on the target. And then finally, in order to complete or in order to, to, to actually execute uh, or to perform this exploit, we need to inject the uh, JNDI LDAP payload into an application input like a login form, API endpoint, etc. The following uh, diagram sort of uh, explains at a high level what's going on. So you can see that we have a Linux server here that's running Apache Tomcat and Apache Tomcat is hosting a web application. And Apache Tomcat in this case has log4j uh, configured and is uh, actually uh, actively logging requests. And uh, all we need to do is inject the payload, as you can see here, uh, within a particular request that's being logged. And once that is done, uh, JNDI, the JNDI lookup plugin will reach out to the LDAP referral server. So this is controlled by us. The LDAP referral server will forward this request to the attacker controlled web server that is hosting the malicious uh, Java class that'll then be that'll then be executed on the target uh, system by log4j as it's being as, as the log is being entered into the 
enter the log file. All right, so uh, as for the tools required to replicate this, uh, you're going to need access to an LDAP referral server. And there's a great tool uh, that you should be familiar with created by Marshall Sec or M, uh, MB Edgler. Uh, apologies if I mispronounce the name. Uh, so you can check this out. Uh, it's fairly simple to set up. All you need to is uh, all you need to do is compile it with Maven, and uh, the setup is really very simple. And of course, you, you'll need OpenJDK in order to compile uh, your Java class. All right. Uh, so now that we have that out of the way, we can actually uh, switch over to the lab environment and, and uh, we can get started with the proof of concept and uh, you know get an idea of how this can be exploited. All right. So I'm just going to so switch like into Yep. Yep. Okay. So real quick, uh, from Scott Moreland, can an unused vulnerable jar file still pose a risk to us? Um, not really. Again, it depends. Uh, is this on the, on the target system or on our system? Doesn't specify, but why don't you talk about either? Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, again, it's uh, very important to understand that the crux of this vulnerability essentially revolves around the GNDI lookup plugin and its ability to interact with, uh, directory services, uh, you know, uh, through protocols like LDAP. And, uh, uh, what we're essentially doing is getting an external resource from whatever location. And in this case, the location is a malicious, uh, web server that is hosting a malicious Java class. And again, once that is logged, it then gets, uh, it then then gets executed or uh, yeah executed on the target consequently giving us uh, remote access so uh, again it, we're really not targeting any uh, any files uh, or any java files on the target system uh, we're essentially getting it to execute a file that's being stored on an external location excellent let's let's take a look at that demo i'm really excited for this all right so uh, the lab environment uh, already has a um, already has a web application that's being hosted on uh, Apache Tomcat. And uh, if let me just open up my terminal here. Uh, so there we are. Let me know if you guys can see what's going on. I can zoom in slightly so you can actually see that. Um, so if we perform an nmap scan on the actual uh, URL or domain, in this case, I will just perform a service detection or service version detection scan on demo.ine.local uh, and hit enter. We'll give that a couple of seconds. All right, so uh, from the Nmap results, we're able to identify that we have Apache Tomcat running on port 80. So again, if we access demo.ine.local on our web server or through our uh, you know, web browser, uh, you can see that we have a, an application, a web app that has been set up to demonstrate this, right? So as I said, uh, the first step for an attacker is to identify an input field or an app any application input that is getting logged by uh, Log4j. And in this case, uh, or when, as I mentioned in the slides, a great starting point is uh, login forms, right? So uh, we can, you know, just pass in some test parameters like test and test and uh, you can see that once I hit enter, it tells me unauthorized, access not allowed, please log in to continue. Now, this particular web application uh, essentially logs all requests being sent to the login page uh, or all login requests. So that means that we can inject the malicious uh, GNDI LDAP um, payload into this particular, uh, you know, it, we can essentially inject it here uh, into this particular application input and uh, in order to test that this does work or you know in order to test that uh, log4j is indeed active uh, what we can do is uh, we can actually i'll just open up my terminal here and i'll just set up a netcat listener uh, on port uh, 1234 just really quickly there all right so that's going to listen on the kali linux ip or on our, on our attacker ip there on port 1234 and uh, let me just open up a new tab here. And what we can do now is uh, we can actually use curl to make a get request and then inject that malicious payload. Uh, and of course, in this case, we, we haven't set up the uh, LDAP referral server yet. Uh, all we're trying to do is trying to verify that a connection is made to our Netcat listener. So before I do that, let me just identify my IP address here. So there it is, that's under ethernet one. All right, so what I'll do is I'll say curl 
And um, I can then uh, put that in single quotes and I'll say demo.ine.local. And uh, this is the login page. And then we can pass in you know, uh, the parameter by uh, making uh, by uh, actually making a request uh, by passing in a, a a a parameter via you know CMD or anything really, um, and uh, we can say CMD equals to and this is where we would inject the the actual payload as long as it's being logged by log4j, uh, then it will be executed. So I can say CMD equal to uh, and then we can specify the actual payload in here. So uh, within the curly braces, I can say. Uh, JNDI, so we're invoking the JNDI lookup plugin, LDAP, and then we provide the address of the LDAP server. As I said, we haven't set it up yet, so I'll just provide my IP address and the port 1234, where we have the Netcat listener running, and uh, I'll just um, close that up there, single quotes, and I'll hit enter. And you can see we don't get any output. However, if we take a look at the Netcat listener, you can see we got a connection here on our netcat uh, listener and uh, we don't get any readable output because that's an ldap request so we do know that it is working log4j was able to uh, you know successfully you know reach out to the ldap server and uh, again in this case this is really not an ldap server but you get the idea all right so now that we've identified that that is working we can begin the actual exploitation all right so the first step will uh, revolve around setting up the actual LDAP referral server. Now this lab environment already has a folder on your desktop and it's called log4j shell poc. And within that directory, we have, um, you're gonna have the log4j RCE check and a POC. And these are, two, these are the two Python scripts that can be used to essentially automate the process that I'm about to show you. However, in this case, we'll be performing it manually. Uh, I disregard the exploit.java file as I created that to demonstrate this a particular exploit. And then you have a target directory here. All right, so the target directory contains the actual uh, jar file uh, that can be used to set up the LDAP referral server. And I, it's already been compiled for you, so you don't need to go through the process of compiling it yourself. And in order to execute it or to set it up, we need to uh, specify a few arguments, right? So uh, because it's a jar file, we can execute it uh, with the following command. So we can say um, Java, and we say cp and the jar file is under target marshall sec 0.0.3 .0 there we are uh, we then need to provide uh, the actual domain for the ldap server that's already been uh, configured for this particular utility and if you take a look at the source code you can customize that based on your own requirements but if you use the default configuration you'll need to set it up as i am here so uh, we specify the domain which is marshall sec dot jndi dot ldap referral server and this is case sensitive we then need to provide the uh, the ip address and the port of the malicious web server we're going to set that up in a few seconds in this case we're going to be setting up the web server uh, on our kali linux ip so uh, that's going to be your attacker ip which i have saved here and uh, you know for quick reference so i'll just copy that there and I'll paste that in there. And the port we're going to be setting up the web server on is uh, port 8080. You can, of course, change that based on your own requirements. And then we need to specify the actual um, Java class that we want uh, executed uh, on the target system, right? Or the actual resource that we're trying to find with JNDI. In this case, we're just going to call the exploit um, exploit. So we'll specify uh, that there. We don't need to specify the extension. And uh, once that is done, we can essentially, uh, you know, just hit enter and this will set up the LDAP referral server for us. So I'll hit enter. As you can see, it's going to say listening on our IP address on 1389. All right. So that's the LDAP referral server port. So just keep that in mind. Once we've done this or once we've set up the LDAP referral server, we'll need to set up and compile the malicious Java class that will be executed on the target. So uh, as I said, uh, I have already set up the Java file here, so I'll just open it up with a text editor so you can see what's going on. All right, so there we are. Uh, we have that uh, under log for shell POC and exploit.java. Um, so there we are. Let me just uh, zoom in a little bit here so you can see what's going on. 
So it's a fairly simple uh, Java class uh, or Java file, if you will. Uh, and uh, all you need to do is specify the actual IP address here, as well as the port uh, that you want to connect to. And this is, of course, going to be the port that you will set up uh, on your Netcat listener. And all this really does is set up or provide us with a reverse shell once it's executed. So the IP address here is going to be your attacker IP address. So this is going to be your Kali Linux IP or you know whatever offensive distribution you're running. And then the port you can change to whatever you're comfortable with. Of course, be sure to note that this port cannot be, uh, you know, you can't use a port that's already being used by any of the other services. So do keep that in mind. All right, so that's the, uh, the actual uh, Java uh, payload that we're going to be using. And we need to uh, compile this into a class. Uh, we can compile this into a class uh, fairly simply using the Java, uh, Java C command or Java compile. And then we specify the file that we want to compile. In this case, it's exploit.java. Now, uh, there's a, something very important that you need to be cognizant of here is based on the version of Java that's running on the target server, you will need to change the source and destination or the source and target uh, compilation options. For example, if the, if the target is running Java uh, or OpenJDK 11, you'll need to specify the source as 11 and then the target as 11, right? Uh, however, in this case, the target is running, uh, is running OpenJDK 8. So we'll say the source is 8 and the target is also 8. And we'll hit Enter. Uh, don't worry if it gives us an issue or a warning there. If I list out the contents of this directory, you can see we have the exploit.class file here. All right, so now that we have, we have been able to compile that, we now need to set up the, uh, the web server that will uh, essentially serve the exploit.class file. Uh, that can easily be uh, facilitated through the use of a Python module called simple HTTP server. <coughs> so simple HTTP server. And uh, remember, we specified that the LDAP server uh, will essentially refer all requests to a web server that's running on port 8080. So we'll specify the port as 8080. And this is going to serve uh, the files within this directory on our IP address on port 8080. So uh, once, um, once we have everything set up, uh, you know, when we uh, inject the, the malicious uh, GNDI LDAP payload and we you know, use curl to, to essentially send a GET request, uh, the GNDI lookup plugin will connect to the LDAP referral server and the LDAP referral server will then forward the request to this web server that again is hosting the exploit.class file that will then be executed on the target system. All right, so now that that is done, we can set up the Netcat listener here. So uh, this, is the, uh, this is the Netcat listener that will be uh, receiving a connection uh, from the reverse shell or from the Java class when it is executed. So uh, again, make sure that you specify the correct port that you had specified within the Java file. Um, so in this case, uh, in my case, uh, it was port 9999, and I'll hit enter. So it's going to listen on that port for a connection. And we can now, uh, you know, essentially create um, or, you know, uh, utilize curl to, uh, to essentially request to perform a GET request uh, and inject that malicious uh, payload or inject the GNDI LDAP payload in order to obtain a reverse shell. All right, so uh, it's fairly simple. We say curl and the demo.ine.local. So login CMD equals, and then we pass in the actual uh, payload here. So uh, we'll say the payload, uh, and um, again, we're, we're utilizing the JNDI lookup. So we'll say JNDI LDAP. And remember, this is uh, all hosted on our IP address or on your lab's IP address. So I'm just going to open up my uh, my text editor here and uh, we will copy that IP there. There we go. And um, I'll paste that in there. And this is going to connect to the LDAP referral server. So we know that the LDAP referral server is uh, listening on port 1389. So make sure that you specify that there. And then the resource that we're looking for is exploit. And you don't have to specify the extension as again, it will automatically instantiate the class file uh, instead of the Java file. So we can say exploit and uh, we can pretty much uh, close the curly braces there. And uh, let me just uh, you know, close the, the actual quotation 
there and we hit enter and it looks like we have a small error here uh, let me just see if i can uh, identify what the issue is here uh yeah so that is a backslash there we are so we hit enter and if we take a look at the netcat listener you'll be able to see that we get a connection from the target and we've essentially obtained a reverse shell so if i type in ls you can see we have the flag that you're supposed to obtain within this lab and we have the tomcat 8 directory so we can uh, again just use python to obtain a bash session here so i can say python import and uh, we can say import pty uh, pty dot spawn and uh, we can execute bin bash like so there we are so use that demo and we can then perform you know just basic enumeration so cat at the issue you can see it's running debian 8 uh, and yeah so We've successfully been able to gain access uh, to the target server through the use of the malicious uh, JNDI LDAP uh, payload. So that really is the proof of concept. Uh, an attacker could, again, utilize the same technique that we've, uh, that we've used right now and also obtain a meterpreter session. So if I terminate the reverse shell here, uh, I can create a quick uh, resource script for Metasploit. And uh, what I can do is uh, use the multi handler to receive the connection back. So that is um, multi handler. I can then set the L host option to our IP address because that's uh, the IP address we're listening on. And uh, we can say copy. There we are. And I'll paste that in there. And then, of course, the L port option has to match. Uh, the the port that you had specified within the um, the actual Java code, which was uh, 9999 in my case. And then, of course, we can just hit run. And uh, this will pretty much automate the process of setting up the handler for us. And we can then write in quit. And I can say MSF console uh, resource script handler.rc. And we'll give that a couple of seconds. There we are. So it starts the reverse TCP handler. And if we just execute the same, uh, or we send, uh, you know, make a get request with curl as we did previously, I'm just going to terminate that there. And we hit enter, we should get a command shell uh, session opened up, as you can see here. So as it says, command shell session one opened, and we pretty much have the same access. I can put this in the background. And if I list out my sessions, you can see indeed it is a command shell session, and then I can upgrade it into a meterpreter session like so. And we'll give that a couple of seconds and we should receive a meterpreter session on the target. All right, so if I list out my sessions, you can see we have it on session two. So session two, sysinfo, there we are. So that is how to exploit the log4j or log4 shell vulnerability. And that concludes the practical demonstration. That is 100% impressive and incredible to watch your master at work. Excellent job. That is. Uh, Thank you very much. Excellent. That was a wonderful, wonderful walkthrough and demo. So having said that, I mean, you just showed us a little bit of the automation that goes into that. Uh, how it, it seemed relatively easy. And like I said, uh, today we will have the lab up on the platform for the, you know, our, our audience and our students to um, get their hands in and see it th for themselves. But what are some of the concerns here with the automation? I mean, this seems pretty easy to do. Um, yeah, I think the the concerns really come down to the fact that um, uh, you know the the tools required are already available, and there are multiple Python scripts as you just saw that will pretty much automate the entire process of what I just did into one terminal session, and will provide you instantly with a reverse shell. So I think the availability of tools, uh, you know, on GitHub, and you know, some of them have not have now been hosted on various mirrors and have been shared on forums. And, you know, we're starting to see a lot of, um, of weaponization of the exploit. So, uh, you know, uh, I know a few people who are working on Metasploit payloads to essentially automate uh, all of this down to just a few, uh, a few clicks, uh, as well as, uh, you know, your various uh, C2 uh, system stages. So, you know, empire stages are being created. So, um, that's really, I think, what the, the main concern is, is the availability of the exploit um, of the exploit code and the various tools are required to facilitate the, the actual exploitation. 
Yeah, so uh, to continue part of this conversation too, I'd like to bring in uh, Jason uh, Alvarado, one of our uh, defensive instructors. I know getting offensive and defensive in the room is sometimes difficult, but hey, here we are, right? Um, so Jason, I mean, this this tool is, you know, Alexi obviously just demonstrated the ease and ubiquity of, of automation here. When we're talking from a defensive standpoint, what are some of the concerns and considerations? And then I know uh, also you have a demo that we could roll into as well, or uh, uh, sorry, slides. Yeah, I've got some slides. Uh, I mean, the considerations for this, I mean, you know, Alexi's demo was great, especially for a blue team person. I think we all have to understand what, what they're doing on the red team so we can do our jobs a lot better. And uh, especially with the, the wide reaching impact of this vulnerability and uh, go ahead and pull the first set of slides up and we can see what's going on there. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so this hits across, and this is certainly a non-exhaustive listing of the impacted applications out there, starting with the entire Apache stack, right? If you're using struts one and two, Spark, Solar, you're, you're exposed. If you're using things like uh, Kafka and Elastic, you're, you're exposed. And then all the other stuff that we're not gonna really get into, and I just want you to see that even our security products are impacted, our network infrastructure products are impacted. And there, there is a, a GitHub repository that's maintaining the list of impacted applications. And it, it, it is just growing and growing and growing almost on an hourly basis. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the blue team difficulties on this, right? It's going to be, you know, a detection of our vulnerable code is extremely difficult because of the number of places this library is used. It's used all over these operating systems. And there are so many different operating systems that can host this LogForge code. And then, of course, our, our detection of exploitations, what Alexi showed, and, and kind of what I'm going to show, you know, is very straightforward, right? We have, we have IP addresses we can see, maybe some DNS we can see. But once you start uh, throwing in the uh, some of the obfuscation that we see a lot of out there, it, it, it makes this a lot harder to detect on the blue team side. So, so we have up here is just a simple thing for, from my perspective, at, at least, right? We, we have a, a similar user agent string that, that Alexi demoed. And if you want to think about, uh, well, look at this. It actually goes a little bit deeper than just LDAP. We have RMI here. And then one thing I left off is, is the DNS one will also execute this. So it's not just the LDAP. Um, I, and then here is what one of our uh, log files is going to look like when we see it come in, because that's really what we're thinking about from a blue team spec perspective is seeing these log files. What we're, what I'm looking for as a blue teamer is I'm looking for uh, the JNDI and then the LDAP or the RMI or the DNS and then the IP address. And if you guys, uh, I know Alexi used an internal IP address. I used one from a, a popular um, a popular cloud provider there. It's just a random IP address from them. Uh, but that, that log entry is what you're going to be looking for. I did see a question previously in the chat asking, could we block this with a WAF or with an IDS IPS? And the answer is yes. You, you can search for these JNDI and LDAP logs and, and in the packets and, and, and see if that traffic is going through there. And you can block that for the inbound or the outbound connections. Now with and that then, though, uh, to, to jump on that blocking when we're talking about defensive mechanisms, I do want to bring up that that requires that you have an IDS or a WAF in front of that application, right? So if it's web facing or it's part of, for example, where this was discovered Minecraft, there's not going to be a WAF that sits between the user input of the string series within that Java element versus, you know, Egg. so that's where some of this does become difficult, right? It, exactly. And uh, and what a lot of people are ignoring in Minecraft is a perfect example of is that you just can't look at your servers, right? We can't guarantee that there's going to be a WAF or, or an advanced layer seven firewall in front of your endpoint at your home. Exactly. And, and, and your endpoint at your home is definitely vulnerable to this. And uh, that that's just, that, that's why this, this vulnerability is just so huge right now. 
It is. I mean, with uh, Alexi, and we'll be bringing Alexi, by the way, for the chat, we'll be bringing mm -hmm. Alexi back in right now. We're just shifting slightly to defensive, and then all in all, we're going to wrap all of this up together and do a round round robin table uh, talk. Yeah. But for the defensive side of this, yeah, I mean, the ubiquity of, um, you know, this library and its usage, it, it really does provide some, you know, new challenges. The best that because I've had I've had multiple people ask me, uh, and I probably you've been hit up too. What do I need to do? And these are you know basic end users that you know they have their own devices, they have their own things, and they're very unsure. And all they see in the news is just you know Log4j. By the way, I will correct myself. I've been calling it Log4j since we started this. I apologize, everyone. I just read it as Log4j. I don't know why. Anyway, so Log4j. You know, I've seen do both. Everybody's doing both. I think, and I think okay. the tool is called Log4j. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> It is what it is. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a little odd. Yeah. It's fine. Um, <laughs> point being is the with with, with this though it it's ubiqu it is everywhere. It is and it is, you know, you have it's showing up in news all over the place. And a lot of people I've been getting pinged by have been asking, what can we do? So I'm going to ask you, Jason, what can we do? I think we just have to keep being vigilant. We have to uh, we have to patch. We have to patch our mm -hmm. systems first and foremost. Um, what, what the reports that I'm seeing back here is, is that patching your system up to, uh, 2.16 is not causing any serious issues within, um, your infrastructure, but you still want to try and test that if you can. Um, but, but patching is the most important thing that you can do right now for your systems. Uh, one thing I did see and haven't had a chance to look at as we were going live, it looks like the Apache foundation actually released another set of patches potentially yes. with uh, with log forge targeted so um definitely look at yeah. that one see what the differences is because as we know 2.15 had some vulnerabilities in it so yes. might be uh, no, more. somebody somebody else brought up in chat um cve 2021 45046 i made sure that i was up on my screen this time because i realized i missed a number when i was reading this off previously mm -hmm. you know that's the love of being live guys but um yeah so basically that there were some holes in the patch that was originally put out by the apache foundation and now we're even going to a new cve to help address the new yeah. vulnerability that was introduced yeah the patch and i've got another patch, one blah, blah, i got another blah, defensive CEU. thing and i got another defensive one and we actually learned this one in solar winds last year and and and, and it's going to be you know use your firewalls if you have your firewalls use your firewalls to prevent remote lookups to unauthorized servers um that really came up when the big question a year ago was, well, why are these solar wind servers even talking to the internet if they don't need to? Same concept applies here. Uh, logging. Absolutely. I mentioned logging. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jack. I was I was going to say I was going to actually bring up. Um, so one of the things too is uh, Matthew Logvin asked uh, for services that are run in the cloud. Example: Azure Cloud. What is really the risk? I get that this gives access to the server, but if they ran in a Docker container in the cloud, question mark. Hmm. I I, th I think they're saying if they land within the actual Docker itself, is that still going to be? Um, is it is it is you know even if they do compromise, is there only compromising the Docker image? Correct. Yeah, I mean that's what it sounds like, especially from from Alexi's demo. But you know what what can they do from there, right? Because once the compromise, once you get your initial foothold, you know it, it, it you know how how does the attacker spread? And you know from what I've seen, they, they certainly have the potential to, especially the way that they're getting their shells. It, it very much so. I mean, actions on the objective, being able to move on and continue forward. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. very, very, um, very capable group, of course, once they, they land. So, um, But with the yeah. logging, I mean, what, what are some of your recommendations regarding the logging? Turn it on. I, and, I, and I know this is, it, it sounds really strange because we're saying turn on the logging for a logging vulnerability. Um, but but you have to be able to find a way to see this logging come in. Um, and then you can start using, and let me just pop back a slide or two, actually, because we kind of jumped ahead. What you can actually do is, is you can actually grep or regular expression search um, for your JNDI and your LDAP and your RMI and your DNS, and that will get you there. If you, if you run these regular expression searches or the grep search and you don't get responses on those, chances are you're okay. You don't, you don't have this tool deployed. Um, if you are getting these, now you have an opportunity to make a decision, right? Do I patch 
Do I do some enhanced logging, enhanced monitoring? You know, it, is, is this a production system and it has to stay up? If it has to stay up, what can I do as a defender to shore up the defenses around this? This is my same old, old argument from the uh, um, credit report scoring vulnerability on struts way back when, right? You don't just ignore it. You, and you, if you can't turn it off, you turn up your, your, your monitoring of it. Right. Yeah. And then, and then you always have an opportunity. One thing I really liked was we came across a, uh, a log for shell detector on GitHub that I've linked here. And what this does is it actually is really good supposedly at finding, um, our, our this vulnerability that's been obfuscated. So I, I really like that. And then of course our EDR tools that, that, that those are going to help us. If you, if you don't have EDR deployed yet in your, in your, a large business or enterprise, you know, I highly encourage it. And, and as a matter of fact, your popular EDR vendors, we don't have a favorite one here <laughs> at INE because they all do this. They will more than likely give you access for up to 90 days to their enterprise suite of problems to resolve an incident if you have one. And that can be for a proactive incident or a reactive incident. They're going to want to sell you their, their product after, after you resolve things. But I mean, me personally, I mean, CrowdStrike or, or Carbon Black for free. For, for a while to help get through this, you know, it, it'll get you there, even if you don't end up purchasing it in the end. I mean, yeah, that's that's an option. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's what we did. I mean, it's, it's, it, that's how incident responders work sometimes. Yeah, it, it very much so is. So with the uh, the logging, the EDR tool, increase the transparency within the enterprise network. Um, yeah. NTC, uh, as end user of platforms you list, what can we do to uh, what can we do to mitigation? Um, I will go ahead and say that you can maintain your upgrades patch whenever you're given the option to, you know, um, upgrade your items. And then, you know, not much else, unfortunately. If, if you're not in control of the software, the application, then there's not much that you can do or you should be doing. Uh, you know, realistically, um, this is, it's unfortunately an enterprise level issue that affects can affect all the way down to the end user that's that's the crux of these vulnerabilities that are in mass correct yeah no i, I agree 100 percent. and 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 that's from the blue team perspective beyond the logs and finding out the strings for this stuff for our detection for us it's the same old thing in my mind mm -hmm. and, and it's just it's just going to be a probably a year-long exercise in detecting all these vulnerabilities and then remediating them one at a time. Yeah, it's, um, it's one of those people wonder, you know, what what's the blue team for? Is it just for phishing? Is it just for evil? No, it's for these. Sometimes the internet's on fire. And that's what you know, that's what blue teams exist for. That's what you have defensive operations for. It's for people like this. Now, one of the things, and I kind of want to bring um, Alexi back into the conversation here and let and start going into the round robin conversation there. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to mention is we talk about this idea of obfuscation. And I wanted to touch on that for a brief second, because for those that are unaware, what obfuscation is, is it's basically taking what the intended target is, be it a string or a command or something like that, and altering it intentionally to bypass standardized monitoring or automated controls or some form of security. Ways that you can do this is you can separate up, uh, for example, PowerShell. If you wanted to send a remote code execution via PowerShell, you can split it up into multiple different commands and send it into multiple packets. On the far end, you can have a listener or or a process that will reassemble all those and run them in conjunction. That's one method. There's another called base 64, which is a form of encoding. Again, these are all courses and classes that we are working to um, increase the knowledge on here at INE. But with that obfuscation, it becomes difficult because some of these requests could look legitimate because it's just a bunch of strings after the fact. You don't see these execution commands in there. So to bring back, I uh, want to bring Jason and Alexi back together on this and uh, talk about the use of obfuscation in these tools and what are some more things that we can do in an enterprise network from both the red and blue team perspective so we can take a look at the purple team process together live. Hey, guys. Welcome back. So with that, from a 
let's let's think of put our heads together on this and think of this from a purple team perspective so start with alexi i mean you just gave us that wonderful demo and that wonderful live demonstration um what are some things that you could do to obfuscate that string we're going to play a little bit of war game scenarios in our minds here and then jason i'm going to switch it to you to counter back and forth okay um yeah so uh, that's a very good question and uh just over the last couple of days we've actually seen uh quite a few uh you know very good obfuscation uh techniques that have been used and one of the most common ones is uh you know the the process of essentially uh separating the actual uh, or you know um breaking up the syntax uh that uh, you know the blue team is uh, typically going to be looking for uh, but i think uh one of the things that you need to keep in mind is uh, given that the, given that this uh, attack essentially involves um, exploiting the uh, a logging system, many attackers are clearing are actually clearing up the logs, uh, the actual uh, log for J logs, which is pretty much the first place uh, that anyone will look. And um, I currently have uh, on my screen uh, right now a few uh, of uh, of those examples in terms of obfuscation, and uh, uh, they they really are impressive in in regards to the way. Uh, that I've seen they're being implemented. So uh, you can see through these examples, they're essentially splitting up the syntax and uh, utilizing various operators to, uh, you know, uh, to essentially uh, obfuscate uh, the, the malicious payload. So uh, we've started seeing a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, a lot of these bypass techniques uh, being implemented. Um, and, you know, the primary one that I've come across is obfuscation. And then, of course, as I said, uh, once an attacker gains access to a system, then uh, they, they essentially have the liberty or the the ability to uh, to to essentially uh, reduce as many uh, to essentially uh, you know get rid of uh, any uh, any logs that might be a little bit suspicious. But uh, yeah, in terms of obfuscation, the, these are pretty much the ones uh, on the techniques that I've seen. Um, so yeah. Okay, so having having shown that, Jason, what with the. Uh with the uh, example that Alexi just provided, what are some of the string queries that you would search for or behavior patterns that you would search for as a blue team member in operations? And Matt, with, you know, imagine that you have an actual logged environment in full transparency. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a logged environment, you know, you know, searching for obfuscation is, I mean, you're searching for a needle in a haystack. I mean, you're, you're getting thousands, millions of logs flowing in. And unless, unless, you're, un unless your system sees something, that, that that alerts you you're probably going to miss it and, and that and that's just the the fact of, of of logging so what you can key on now especially defensively right now if you wanted to do some proactive hunting for this you could set up some queries and some alerts in your systems to to search for the ldap and and the uh jndi you know the jndi colon ldap i might just be putting heightened awareness around that and starting off with some with some really good maybe overly <laughs> overly necessary alerting on, on those for a while and just start inspecting them and getting a and then at least getting a, a, a feel for what my normal is on that and then you know see if there's any obfuscation <laughs> something that jumps out i that to me it's it's a lot of needle in the haystack hunting yeah i think also alexi hit on a really good point about clearing the logs so i would definitely check any logs that have been recently cleared um, and definitely set some tripwire alerts up for any log clearing that happens. Uh, so that way we can check that uh, account. Yeah, um, and if I could on that, um, you know, just any type of unusual system activity uh, as far as configuration changes and, you know, even processor spikes. Um, those are going to be the big okay. tip offs for us. But unfortunately, sometimes it's too late when we start seeing those. Uh, yeah, I 100% agree. Now, having talked about that, let's ask the bigger question. Each of you take a couple, you know, give us give us a, a little bit of uh, your your personal feelings. How impactful is this? How big is this really? Like, how do you think we're going to be dealing with it for just a month? It's a flash in the pan because we've got it handled. Or do you think this is going to be far reaching? We'll start with uh, you, Jason. I think we're going to be dealing with this for at least a year. We're going to be dealing with with this and its derivatives for at least a year. Everything that comes out of this. And I think the bigger, more further reaching on this is that we're, we're looking at almost like a heart bleed type situation where, you, you know, you know, this, this, you know, what other Java classes and what other open source tools aren't getting the, the attention they need to be getting from a, a secure coding and a DevOps perspective 
to, to prevent these things from happening again. Absolutely. Alexi. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, um, I, I definitely see this lasting for a couple of years uh, at, at the very least, primarily because of how fragmented uh, this particular package is and, you know, it's ubiquity, uh, it's ubiquity uh, primarily because tons of applications, uh, you know, utilize this package as a dependency. So uh, that's really where I see a, a lot of the issues because, you know, um, for, from an end user perspective, uh, if they're using a piece of software, you know, a piece of Java software, and they're not familiar or not aware of the fact that uh, it does utilize a log4j in, in whatever or to, to whatever extent, then, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're going to be vulnerable. And uh, as I said, uh, this will really affect uh, individuals or companies without, you know, any proactive, uh, proactive security in place or without a vulnerability management program. Um, so, uh, yeah, I definitely see, uh, I definitely see it being around for quite a while, uh, especially on, uh, in, you know, environments where there isn't any, uh, real sense of security uh and any idea of uh, you know patch management so yeah that's uh th that's really my own personal opinion yeah um so just wanted to hit a couple comments real quick uh Munra, uh and uh stalin babu uh basically they both asked is there a solution to block this can microsoft can some certain t tools or technologies block this very specifically cisco firepower firewall microsoft 365 I don't know, <laughs> to be bluntly honest. It's uh, it's a very specific topic in technology, um, and odds are very good that they are likely working on something there to implement it. And that's kind of something I wanted to mention real quick, guys, is that, um, you know, it, it's a large part of cybersecurity is taking a look at what is in your enterprise currently and figuring out if that specific vendor will or will not be uh, engaging in that. Um, I will... I would actually put money that they are probably working on something. Um, it's the, as we just said, this is pretty ubiqui ubiquitous and a big deal, right? So we want, um, yeah, I, I, like I would, that's an easy bet for me to say they probably are. Well, Jason, Alexi, um, you know, it's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing the knowledge and the um, ongoing continuation for, you know, excellence with the demos and the uh, things that we can do. Um, as a reminder, guys, we will be posting this video, a walkthrough and a lab up on our platform today. Um, and I wanted to hit one more question real quick for you two. Douglas asks, what would be your suggestion for micro and small businesses, uh, their particular client base, order of triage? Is there anything that they can do to spot this at their level? Um, you know, sans a service provider. Uh, let's start with Jason. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, and, and the big thing is, is that uh, small businesses are are definitely incredibly vulnerable, and you have to do some things to increase your uh, your security, including your your security spend on that. You, I think you just have to factor it in. Um, you know, you, you can't just get the cheapest firewall that's out there. You certainly can't rely on your uh, utility vendor's firewall. Um, and, and and you have to make sure that you're that you're 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 updating your antivirus. I, I I strongly recommend working with managed service providers so they can they can take care of your IT environment for you. And and you know that there's lots of solutions out there going that way. Yeah, uh, Lexi. Um, yeah, I think for uh, you know for small and uh, micro businesses. I think having a good idea of what uh, technologies they're using um, in regards to uh, to primarily to Apache, as well as a few others, they should have a good understanding of what they're utilizing, whether they're hosting a website or really anything else. If they have a an application that's uh, that's developed in Java, they should. Uh, I think they should take uh, some time analyzing it and identifying whether or not they are utilizing Log4j. And um, uh, you know, I think. Uh, the crux of this vulnerability revolves around the JNDI lookup plugin. So the quickest way of, of actually mitigating this vulnerability is just disabling the plugin, which can be done fairly simply. But as I said, the problem is knowing whether or not you have log4j running um, 
and that can be quite difficult, especially you know when you start moving into me- medium and large sized uh, companies and enterprises. But I think um, for a small to for small to micro uh, you know sized businesses, uh, you know uh, having a, a good idea of what your assets are. Uh, you know what they're hosting, what stacks uh, are you know being used to host uh, those applications or whatever they're hosting, and uh, of course identifying whether or not they are utilizing Log4j in some way, and then of course uh, impl- uh, implementing the, the the actual patches either through the um, through the actual vendor through through Apache themselves or through uh, you know Log4j doing it manually. So um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, China P, accounting is always important in any environment, IMO. Yes, it really is. And when we're talking about this, I think that this goes to asset management and just knowing what you have. You can only defend what you know about, right? Like there's always um, there's always something to be said for blind spots when it comes to enterprise technology. Well, guys, uh, thank you again so much for your time and your excellence as always. Uh, we will be talking soon. Um, for us here at INE Live, that's going to wrap this up for the Bits and Bytes edition. Thank you, everyone. As always, I really do hope that we will continue to be value added. Um, we will have, as a, another reminder, this video, the demo labs, and a walkthrough up on our platform within the next few hours. Um, and please don't forget to hit the like, follow, or subscribe buttons, depending on which platform you're tuning into us for to stay up to date on all the technology education and news. Thank you for your time. You guys have a wonderful, happy holidays, and we will definitely see you in the new year. Appreciate you. Goodbye.